Welcome back to New World Next Week. I'm James Corbett of CorbettReport.com. And I'm James Evan Pilato of MediaMonarchy.com. Minnesota towns join forces to build their own internet. We've got that story. Plus, the Big Brother Corporation lives up to its name. But first, from FindBiometrics.com, Sims disconnected for Saudis who have not registered their biometrics. Saudi Arabia's Communications and Information Technology Commission, CITC, has gone ahead and disconnected the mobile subscribers who haven't registered their fingerprint biometrics, as the Saudi Gazette reports. The initiative appear, appears to be a security effort similar to those that have been undertaken in other countries, such as Pakistan and Bangladesh, in, ensuring that biometric authentication is used for SIM registration is seen as a means of preventing terrorists and criminals from fraudulently obtaining mobile devices, which can be used in illegal plots. Saudis who have been disconnected are still able to reconnect their SIMs if they register their biometrics in 90 days and counting. So if you don't give your fingerprints to the state, obviously you're planning terrorism. James, it's funny, here in the States, we don't really have to do anything like that because everybody's already given their fingerprints for the latest Apple device, right? Yeah, exactly right. Well, uh, this is a funny story because I wonder how the Saudi government defines terrorists. I'm assuming that they're not talking about uh, the, the Wahhabi, you know, Al-Qaeda brands that they support. They're probably talking about Shia um, terrorists, people who actually want to upset their government. But anyway, all of that aside, um, well, I can see nothing that could possibly go wrong with such a... Prop oh, wait, are these the same biometrics that we just talked about the other week can be easily uh, re replicated, easily um, stolen for all intents and purposes? Police are now 3D print printing dead man's fingers to... So, you know, to unlock their phone. I mean, this is, again, once again, even if this wasn't Orwellian surveillance panopticon nonsense, the idea that you can have your biometrics easily stolen and no way to get them back, no way to undo that, no way to get a new set of fingerprints. This is, I mean, it's insanity. It's insanity. But uh, if people comply with it, I mean... The only thing to do is not comply with biometrics. And uh, that's the, uh, uh, as you say, people are willingly doing it with their fondle slabs. Well, and, and here in Oregon, if I want to be able to, to get behind the wheel, if I want the privilege of being able to get behind the wheel of a car, I had to have my picture taken with the DMV. When I first moved here, it was just a regular old photo. But of course, like many states around, they've updated and now it's a digital photo and now it's part of the state database. And if anything's a part of the state database, you know, it's probably going to be a part of the federal database. I think this is really interesting because of the story that we covered several months back about the new Saudi agenda and how they are sort of heading into the future. So I find a lot of these stories now with Saudis in the news a lot. Maybe not so much for, you know, killing kids in Yemen as much as they should be, but they are in the news a lot and they are sort of our... U.S. partner in a lot of ways. And I'll include one related note. $1.15 billion in U.S. weapons will soon be heading to Saudi Arabia as the Prince of Peace Prize approves, I think, more weapons sales than I think any other president in recent history, if not all of American history. James, you got any other words about SIM cards? Let's move on. All right, let's move on to the UK with a really interesting story. I talked about it just a little bit on the Morning Monarchy the other morning, but I don't know that I really delved into it entirely, and I think we can kind of get at the heart of it here a little better. Via an article from Tech Dirt, BBC now training its secret, likely imaginary, fleet of detector vans on your Wi-Fi. Nearly a decade ago, Tech Dirt wrote about the fact that the BBC supposedly has a fleet of secret detector vans that drive around trying to figure out who was watching the BBC without paying for it? As you probably know, if you live in the UK, you're forced to buy a BBC license if you have a TV or a TV Turner card. And for years, they've claimed to have had these magical detector vans. When Techner first wrote about them in 2008, it was because of a Freedom of Information request to find out about the vans. And it was denied for the most ridiculous of reasons. Revealing the details of the vans would damage the public's perception of the effectiveness of the TV detector vans. In other words, the vans, if they exist at all, were more about scaring people into paying rather than actually detecting those watching the BBC without a license. So either way, real or fake, 
Those vans are back in the news after the Telegraph recently reported that the vans have now been outfitted with apparent Wi-Fi detection tools to go after people watching the BBC online without paying. Those eye players you may have seen. Even if the vans don't really work or don't really exist, it should serve as a clear reminder of how surveillance efforts are at least a constant temptation for those in power allowing what was officially put in place for national security to creep into totally unrelated areas. Great question is, if media companies could actually build a van to cruise around and sniff Wi-Fi looking for pirates, does anyone really think that they wouldn't do that? Now, James, I think what I didn't kind of get into when I discussed this just kind of briefly on the Morning Monarchy the other day, the idea that whether these are real or fake gets at the heart of the panopticon. The power of the Panopticon, going all the way back to Bentham writing about it, is that you don't really know whether or not you're being watched for sure. So it keeps you in place. What was the story we talked about a while back, people of, of sort of censoring themselves online? You know that you're being watched. They want you to know that they're watching you, even if they're not totally watching you all the time. In a lot of ways, it's almost kind of godlike, James. Well, Big Brother-like anyway, for sure. Uh -huh. And yeah, I mean, it, it, that that line is hilarious to me. Revealing the details of the vans would damage the public's perception of the effectiveness of the vans, i.e. they don't do what they say they're doing. Um, it's, it's pretty open what they're saying there, even if they're trying to obfuscate it. But hilarious nonetheless. Um, not so much for my fellow brothers and sisters out in the UK, but um, here's the thing. Here's something that's intriguing to me. How do these Wi-Fi detector vans, assuming they even existed, how would they precisely know what you are looking at online? How would they know that you're picking up BBC online as opposed to any other website? Are they actually sniffing uh, the, the packets and, and uh, examining them, the contents of what you're looking at? That seems extremely Orwellian. Now, in this article, they speculate that maybe um, the BBC would program the iPlayer to send packets of certain sizes, so they would detect the packet size. But still, it just seems, I don't know, there's some, something off about that. But hey, I, I don't even believe they're really doing this. I think it is just about getting people to live in fear. They see everything. They know they're Santa Claus. They're watching. You better be good, or you'll get a lump of coal. Um... So, again, I think the answer is the same as it al has always been. Don't comply. <laughs> when they come to your door, just say nope and slam the door. No, thank you. Well, and I, maybe, I, maybe I speculated that they could, could they know what you're watching if you don't have your Wi-Fi secured or locked up. I think I've noted that at least here in America, it's like, well, we, you're only a bunch of people who don't know how to program a VCR. So they probably all have their unlocked Wi-Fi codes. And the possibility is, of course, there. But I think just sort of philosophically, the heart of the story is really about the, the power of believing you are being watched at all times. Our third and final story on this 279th episode of New World Next Week for August 11th, 2016, comes via undergroundreporter.org. Over two dozen rural towns in southern Minnesota fed up with waiting for corporate high-speed internet to reach them, have taken it upon themselves to build a fiber optic network of their own, and they're doing it entirely without federal funding. Last July, Politico highlighted the disaster that became of a federal program signed into life by President Obama in 2009, designed to bring high-speed internet to rural communities. Shocker, the Rural Utilities Service was yet another government boondoggle, and we'll include links about that in the show notes. And again, everything we say and play will be included in the show notes to continue the research on. Residents in Minnesota, however, it seems have found a way to work around this issue. There, 27 small towns in four counties formed a cooperative, RS Fiber, that will, if everything goes to plan, be providing its members high-speed fiber optic internet by 2021. To achieve this, the community created an entirely new financing model. The towns issued resident-approved bonds that covered nearly half the cost of the first phase of the project, around $16 million, which in turn made local banks feel safe enough to give loans to cover the rest. That's a win-win, says Chris Mitchell of the Institute for Local Self-Reliance, recently talking to Yes Magazine, saying it's a model in which local governments can take on the risk if they're willing and local banks can get a very reasonable return. Now, leaving aside the parts of governments and banks, James, I love the idea, again, of people just building their own Internet. We've got family that are in New Mexico that are just 
oh yeah, internet's coming anytime now, except that it's probably totally not. James? I don't understand this story. Are you saying there are people who aren't just sitting there twiddling their thumbs begging for Comcast or some big corporate internet to come to come to their door? What's going on? People are taking this into their own hands? Oh, freedom, terrible freedom. Uh, yes, this is just an example, and it may not be the best example, but is an example of how people can actually proactively create things that they want in their communities rather than waiting for some big corporation or some government to come down and hand it to them. And on that note, I just wrote an article about uh, Dear Government, Deliver Us from Freedom, talking about different ways that people can, not only can, but are actually creating alternatives through agoristic, uh, decentralized, peer-to-peer solutions in all sorts of different realms. From global cash transfers to uh, delivering meals to the homeless to all sorts of you know innovative ideas for one a cell four one one and things like that. Uh, check out the article if you haven't yet. There are a lot of innovative ideas that are coming down the the pike right now, and um, I think it's unstoppable. I really do think it's unstoppable because once people start collaborating, coordinating their own efforts with each other, trying to help each other rather than waiting for some savior in the sky to come down and hand it all to them. I mean, that's the secret. The secret is we have the power. And uh, that's what they desperately don't want you to think about. Because if they can keep you dependent on their system, then they can keep their control over you. I would have filed that story under good news next week. But as I've taken a little bit of time off, I haven't actually made a good news next week episode. And sometimes the good news can be hard to find. So if you know of good ways that we are winning and some solutions going on wherever you are in the world, we'd love to read about them at hashtag good news next week but of course the classic hashtag new world next week has a wealth of news that could really just be your one-stop shop all in some ways to know a lot of what's going on in the world using hashtag new world next week and we appreciate everybody who submits stories from all around the world the age of virtual flag terror is here australia blames overseas hack attack for their census fail and wikileaks offers a twenty thousand dollar reward for information in the murder of a dnc staffer likely the source of the dnc leak james it's pretty much gotten to the point now if anything happens oh hackers oh email uh hackers russians did it Russian hackers it's virtual flag terror you're not really gonna know and a lot of times it's probably just gonna point back to some sort of military installation that pays its soldiers to fight the net like an enemy weapon system. That's all I got. Yeah, that's it. And uh, yeah, you're exactly right. Who's the boogeyman today? Russians? Okay, it was them. Yeah, that's the uh, that's the script for the next several years. All right, I think we're going to leave it there for today. But before we go, I will just encourage all our listeners to take a moment to uh, write to James or contact him via any of his various contact methods on MediaMonarchy.com to wish him a happy birthday as he is yeah. uh, he's going to be a year older as of the time you're watching this so That's it. all right thank you thank for you. Uh, for your work and looking forward to doing it again thanks man take care <laughs>